2023, wow. I have a long-standing belief that the year a Zelda game comes out, a life-altering moment occurs for me, and the year of Michael Jordan is very special to me. 2023 is the year, probably going down as the best year of video game releases. Everyone was able to eat good. Every kind of RPG came out, so no one was missing out. Street Fighter 6 and Mortal Kombat 1 came out this year, and then Tekken 8 comes out later this month. Remakes and remasters were a big theme, but it was a perfect opportunity for old fans to replay and new fans to discover them. Nintendo fans got another treat of Zelda and Mario titles and brought back fan favorites. Xbox finally seemed to get their own exclusives going, but Game Pass continues to have some solid day one releases from third parties and PlayStation fans gets two Final Fantasy games within a year of each other. And two Spider-Man 2s. Hell, we got some new handheld PCs too. There were even bad games, like comically bad games this year, but I didn't play them because I only want to play good games. Even the industry branched outward with some movie and TV adaptations breaking expectations and records. And a GTA 6 announcement? But as much as the backlogs got bigger for almost everyone this year, it was tough on many people directly involved with video games. Layoffs were a constant theme, both from developers, publishers, and media professionals as well. Capitalism doesn't care, and that sucks since many people's livelihoods were affected. We have to remember behind many of these good games, there were thousands of people working, collaborating, and putting their sweat, tears, and years of their own lives into making, selling, and talking about these games. That's why sometimes you see production babies in the credits. I hope they all bounce back and they're onto bigger and better things. Now, I wasn't able to play every single game that came out this year. I did try my best, but as someone who plays games as a hobby and not a livelihood, I think playing this amount isn't too bad. Just to be upfront, there were a few games I wish I did play, like Final Fantasy 16 and Alan Wake 2, but man, I have a full-time job. Caveat, I did play about six or so hours of Baldur's Gate 3 with my wife, but we stopped really early in Act 1, and I decided I'm just gonna have to play it in 2024. Oh well. For this year's list, I'm changing it up a little. This time, I'm listing all the games I've put in serious time, and there were quite a few. And to be upfront, I'm also kind of weighing it a little differently. This list is categorized by how much I enjoyed a game and felt amazed by it. I'm giving the edge to games I've never played before and some bonus points to those that came out in 2023. As a note, the rankings themselves don't really count until like top 20, but I got tiers labeled so you can gauge how I feel about them in context with other games. So yeah, there's some games that technically should be higher, but whatever, this is my list. I won't get into spoilers unless I otherwise point it out, but keep in mind, this is my own footage, so there might be some out of context visual spoilers Spoilers. All right, anything else? No? Okay, what's up? My name is Super This Way. I played 42 games in 2023, and here's some thoughts about them. So, in the spirit of my favorite Mario animation, Princess, don't you cry. I'm gonna buy you a pizza pie. And if that pizza pie gets eight, Luigi will buy you a New York steak. Let's go! Yeah, hot take, this game is whatever. Take everything I say with a grain of salt because truly this isn't my kind of game. I haven't played Pokemon since Gold and Silver, but I'm a casual Pokemon lurker. The gameplay is still the same as it ever was, but it feels so slow in this day and age. Obviously a big critique is the performance and it's pretty distracting. There are a lot of things I don't like about Pokemon Violet that I could make another video on just on that alone, but that's too long and I don't want to make a hater video. It's hard to recommend this game for anyone who's not into Pokemon. It feels old. It's clunky to explore and figure out the systems. I know people who swear this is the best Pokemon game in quite some time, but it probably had to do with the open world mechanics bringing fresh air to a really stagnant and outdated formula. Sometimes I had fun, probably because of nostalgia. Waves. I will admit some of the characters were really funny and Nimona is probably the greatest best friend bully I've ever seen so not all is lost here. You Suck at Parking is a game I downloaded from Xbox Game Pass because I wanted to play something mindlessly for a bit. It's alright, a fun distraction and a little bit challenging given the simple premise of driving and then parking because you can't reverse and once you stop, that's it. It's fine. There's a battle pass too which is cool for the direction of video games. I really wanted to enjoy Inscription, but I think the roguelike mechanics tore me down. Roguelikes are fine, but sometimes it can feel a little unfair or lopsided for forcing you to replay rather than move on and go forward. I am a fan of Inscription, and I did like it, up to a certain point. The multiple forced losses and having to start all over and play your way back is 
disheartening at times. It's not a hard game, but it can be difficult if you're not into deck building or it's not a familiar concept. So it's not made for those who want to brute force through objectives, but for slow burners who can internalize strategies and create an effective deck of cards through RNG. I really dig the premise and its atmosphere as being a deck building roguelike that also doubles as an escape room of sorts. But I had to break away from playing after so many tough losses and just watch the playthrough on YouTube. I really want to like this game, but it's not for me. Warframe is a pretty straightforward free-to-play looter shooter. I played it for several hours, I enjoyed my time, and then I stopped. It's alright. Yeah, it's alright. ESO, as the community calls it, is fun with friends on a Tuesday night and you're just chilling and killing some baddies. There's a lot you can do here. It's an MMO built in the Elder Scrolls world and has several expansions. This game is massive, but the best part is if you don't care and you just want to quest with the boys and or girls, you really can't do wrong with Elder Scrolls Online. Sucks that you can't crossplay with this game though. This is one of the most hated games out there for something that it has a million daily active players. Listen, I really like Overwatch 2. I built my first PC in the summer and it was the game that got me comfortable with keyboard and mouse, which I gotta hand it to the PC master race freaks, a broken clock is right twice a day. But yeah, Overwatch 2 is a pretty good decent game. Don't play it if you value your sanity. When I played this on the Wii back then, it was pretty okay. In fact, there are only two things I remember about it. It was repetitive and I hated those motion controls. It's unfortunate this game's legacy for a moment were those takeaways and being the last quote unquote traditional Zelda before Breath of the Wild came out. But this remaster really polishes out the rough parts. Skyward Sword on the Switch is the best version to play this flawed Zelda entry. It's still better than most games out there, but this was a game made in a different time and made for a specific system and controls. Tantalus did try their best to tune the experience with control sticks and it does work. However, the best way to play Skyward Sword is still motion controls with the Joy-Cons detached. But it's also the most annoying way to play if you're not into that style. But this Skyward Sword replay was a much better time than my first playthrough. So that says something about how well this remaster is. I could talk about the Zelda outing for some time because it's such a consequential game for the series, fans, and the devs. I think all Zelda games are essential to play, and while Skyward Sword isn't on the top of my personal list, I do recommend it. Yeah, this is my, what, fourth replay? Replayed it mostly to get footage for my videos, but also because I was hyped for tears. Breath of the Wild is a much better game than this number would otherwise indicate, and better than many games on this list. So yeah, this is a great game. Maybe I'll talk about it again later on. This is one of those games that Breath of the Wild is better than, but damn my rules. The biggest knock against this game is how short and unfulfilled it is. Storyteller's premise is simple. You have a story prompt and you need to recreate it with the provided settings and characters. The game is best played as a party game with friends and family. The arguments and spontaneous ideas shot up from them is a fun time I'm sure the devs anticipated. A good logic puzzle party game, but it's so shallow. Once you get through all the chapters, that's it. It's not long enough to replay it at the next party or gathering, and it's not deep enough for extended playthroughs like trivia, Jackbox games, or even those browser-based games Zoom and Discord would offer. Fun for a one-time playthrough, and that's it. Up to you if that's worth it. A Way Out is unique in being a strictly co-op game about two characters breaking out of prison and getting revenge on a mutual enemy. The writing is not amazing, but in a good way somehow. The story is inspired on a lot of the archetypes of the rogue anti-heroes of crime films and borrows a lot of the ideas to create this collage of homage, but the plot is built on contrivance, especially after the ending where everything comes together. But the star of the show is the co-op. Not many split-screen couch co-op games out there, and even rarer for a game that's built around this specific mechanic. And yet, this one scratches that itch a little bit. You get to troll with your partner or get trolled by them. The sprinkle of minigames is a bit endearing and video gamey, which makes it so much better. A Way Out is a little uneven, starting from a simple puzzle light game, then bouts of different action set pieces mixed in. Your experience will hinge on your partner, but my playthrough with my godfather was fun. It's not a masterpiece, it's not a great game, but it's a pretty okay game. 
Pentiment is another one I didn't finish, but I did put in a lot of hours. I played through Act 1 and most of Act 2, but stopped because, I don't know, I guess life happened and I just didn't get back into it. It's pretty good from what I played. It's just a tad bit more than a visual novel, click and point style game. It is dialogue and choice heavy, so needing to pay attention to the narrative and descriptions is key. I do appreciate how the art direction and historical details help immerse you into 16th century Germany. I will eventually get back to finishing this game because because I did enjoy it. I just need to get in the mood for it again. Also, the game's director, Josh Sawyer, is hilarious and just really cool on Twitter or X, so you should follow him there. I am not a huge mobile gamer, but I also spend a lot of time on the bus or train on my phone. So, Mini Metro is a sweet game of pretending you're the public transportation engineer trying to connect the city one train line and stop at a time. It's a fun challenge to beat your high score with new tricks and repeatedly redrawing the train lines. As a side note, there are a lot of good stuff on Apple Arcade which if you're into mobile games or got an Apple TV and a game controller, it's definitely worth to check it out. Hashtag not sponsored. Speaking of which, here's another Apple Arcade hit. Finity is a solid twist of Tetris Attack and threes in a 4x4 grid. Line up the color blocks before the squares lock you down for moves. And rinse and repeat, and rinse and repeat, and rinse and repeat. There's also enough quirks and challenges to keep you on your toes. Fingers? And like any true good puzzle game, a simple and effective time waster. So the vibes on this game are pretty weird. Resident Evil 3 Remake is a rails-on shooter with some light survival horror elements the series is known for. You play as Jill Valentine as she goes through her terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day by trying to run away from the seemingly unkillable ultra super zombie nemesis. There are a few gripes. The game is too short, it's driven mostly by its cutscenes and not its gameplay, some mechanics don't always feel right like dodging, and the survival horror elements taking a big step back to the action set pieces. The good news is it's still a pretty fun Resident Evil entry, and it's really short so hooray for those who want a game in a hurry. It's worth a playthrough but as a heads up you may come away expecting more. A short hike and it's a short game. Play this if you're in the mood for a relaxing vibes kind of game. 20 Minutes Till Dawn is the solid dual stick shooter if you're looking for something similar to Vampire Survivors. The art style leans into the retro aesthetic with a simple color palette. Character abilities and skills you pick up do feel powerful, especially as you level up. Another solid quick time killer. Combine Fall Guys and Gang Beasts with the toxicity of Mario Party and you get party animals. The best way to have fun with friends online. Found this on the Apple Arcade and this is just a silly game full of references. Obviously the objective for What the Golf is to get the ball into the hole, but there's such a nice WarriorWare micro game feel that makes the premise work again and again. You'll definitely find something that will bring you joy here. A battle royale based on the Super Nintendo version of an underutilized franchise. F-099 is a fun time waster. The latest in the NSO's 99 series, this one takes off all the required features. Screaming for making some mistakes? Check. Replaying the same levels over and over again? Check. Almost impossible getting first place? Check that three times. But the most important one, an easy and fast way to get some gaming endorphins. F-099 is a hope for a serious return of this long dormant franchise. I never played this game seriously until this year and the original Legend of Zelda surprisingly holds up really well, in a way. I didn't play it the way God intended as I used the walkthrough guide. Yeah yeah, I know, whatever, I'm glad I did. I cannot imagine trying to find the secrets or some really esoteric stuff on my own and how much of the upgrades are locked behind walls that do not look different compared to other walls. But playing it with a guide and trekking through the dungeons and fighting bosses was fun and a nice nostalgia trip to see how far video games have come. There are many more technically impressive games since 1985, but it's all a callback to this OG. Novels have Don Quixote, films have Citizen Kane, and video games have The Legend of Zelda. Perspective is a beautiful word that has become this buzzword of sorts. Superliminal challenges you to shift your perspective literally. It's similar to Portal with the premise, setting, 
portals and this weird grab mechanic. But what Slipper Liminal does really well is recreating a drug trip through a puzzle game. This sounds a bit horrible, but it was a really great time. If eerie first person puzzle games are your jam, you can't skip this one. A hack and slash set in the Breath of the Wild world? And you can play as Prime Impa? Hell yeah, sign me up. Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity is pretty alright arcade spinoff. Yeah, there are some sore spots, namely the quality of the game isn't as up there as Breath of the Wild. But if a smash em up is what you're looking for, Age of Calamity is a decent choice. And I don't really care if the story is canon or not, but they really missed the opportunity to tell a Zelda story with a sad ending like Rogue One or Halo Reach. This is what you get when you mix Dark Souls and Star Wars and it's made by EA. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order is a solid game that scratches the action-adventure Jedi game itch I've had for quite some time. It's not perfect, there are still bugs in the game not to mention the need to suspend your disbelief about lightsabers not cutting through the thousands of stormtroopers you're killing. But if you're looking for a straightforward action game that takes you around the galaxy, fight the Empire, and do some neat tricks, you're not making a bad choice here. Unfortunately, I did not play Jedi Survivor, so don't look for it in this list. But I have played Kirby in the Forgotten Land, and how can you not like this game? This is the 3D refresh the franchise has needed. It's super easy to get into and really hard to not continue playing. The levels are digestible with neat art direction, not to mention how everything is so cute and adorable. This is Kirby at their best, and I can't wait to see what's next for this pink ball. The best thing about this game is its simplicity. Super Mario RPG is a one-to-one -one remake of the Super Nintendo classic, retaining all the charm, mechanics, and aesthetic of the Squaresoft original. This is the Mario game that wouldn't get made today. It's like watching a 4K restoration of Mario in his experimental heyday of just doing random stuff. There are some minor shortcomings with some outdated mechanics, slow animations, and odd pacing, but it's crystal clear and still a fun experience. Hopefully this and the Paper Mario Thousand Year Door remaster are signs Nintendo is going back to their roots when it comes to the future of these Mario RPG spin-offs. One thing about 2023 is how many solid chill puzzle games have come out and Cocoon is a gem. The combination of portal universes and isometric gameplay is ingenious and clever. There's only one button you need to press and one object you need to interact with, but the possibilities could be endless. This game could have gone on for several hours longer, but it does hit that sweet spot of being a fairly short game to get through. A classic indie puzzle game and one you should check out. Honestly, I wasn't expecting to like Starfield this much. By no means is it one of the best games out there, and it also has a lot of things against it, like loading screens and a game design that's running on fumes at this point. But then those don't really matter if I got a lot of enjoyment out of it, right? You get to play however you like within this game, within reason. Go to space and explore, research the planets, become a pirate, take on bounties, solve interstellar crime cases, and blah blah blah, yeah yeah, we all know that. The beauty within Starfield is how once you drop your guard down, Ignore all the mechanics that you have no interest in learning and just play the game however you like. It feels like that Bethesda magic formula all over again. But you have to play it in a specific way, so that's probably the crutch. There is some jank for sure. The loading screens are constant, especially when you're really just fast traveling through the universe. A lot of the mechanics are complicated at first glance. Freaking encumbrance, menu management, and the always hilarious Bethesda bugs. But the space dogfighting, intriguing mystery premise, and cool missions and side quests help elevate the experience. There's also really cool a new game plus mechanic that works really well within the in-games universe but you do lose all your ships and stuff to collect it so that's a bummer what happens when you base the premise of a game on a sterile platforming mechanic from a lot of triple a games but tweak it so it's fun well you get this jusan is a quickish game where you just need to climb this big ass mountain the gameplay is tight and enjoyable the controls art direction and the chill energy perfectly mesh the sauce is how well the climbing works as the main gameplay loop don't nod was able to figure out how to get much more fulfilling engagement than the usual climbing mechanics that appear in AAA titles and built the entire game around it you feel certain satisfaction achieving milestones on this mountain that once you finish you kind of want to see if there's another mountain to climb highly recommend this game especially if you want some chill vibes hi-fi rush feels like a remake of a rhythm action game that was released during the gamecube ps2 xbox era the action mechanics are unique leaning on you to play to the beat of the music for better combos and higher scores there is a lot of joy to be had here 
The music is timely, the fights and art style are sharp and visually chaotic, and the writing is genuinely funny. Like, Chai should not be as charming as he is. And while this is a rhythm game with some required timings, it does have a lot of leeway and is forgiving for the folks who don't have an ear for it. Hi-Fi Rush is a complete package. Somehow, everything seems to be alive and vibrant. Play it. The Metroid series has the unfortunate distinction of being the namesake of a popular genre and having critically acclaimed standouts, but pales in comparison to the commercial success of other top tier Nintendo IPs. And I do hope Metroid Dread is a flashpoint for the series. This game is really good. There's a certain flow, speed, and smoothness as you're running through doors and climbing, sliding, and falling. This is a speedrunner's game where you have so many functionality and mechanics at your disposal to be able to zigzag your way through the levels. And the main draws of shooting aliens, exploring the hellscape of a well-designed map, and taking down gigantic bosses are all here. Also, I love how Samus is so sassy and cold as hell. Like, it's another stroll in the park. Metro Dread is also hard as hell, maybe at times a little bit on the annoying side, there is a heavy reliance on the player being able to parry, but mastering that skill will make the game much easier. And now more characters could join the roster of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Just kidding! Intelligent Systems continues improving, refining, tweaking, and increasing the scope of the series with Fire Emblem Engage. The gimmick this time around is having the greatest hits tour with prominent characters from previous entries serving as assist trophies to your team. The best part is how Engage just lets you make any of your characters OP as hell. This wrinkle carries out so many permutations of what kind of strategy to employ as well as you can just undo your actions so you can experiment without starting all over if you're playing classic mode permadeath like a sickle. The gameplay is probably the best Fire Emblem has seen in a long time, but the story and writing drags the immersion down with drawn out cutscenes, subpar writing, and probably way too many characters to care about since the story only goes in one direction unlike in previous entries. With that said, Fire Emblem Engage is still essential to play, especially if you're a fan of the series. I usually play dungeon crawlers with friends and most of the time I just play on autopilot, not digging deep into the systems, lore, or understanding the consequences of my actions when I select the class or skills. Sorry to ESO, Warframe, and a bunch of other games. And pretty much Diablo 4 was going to be a retread, but on one random day where I played by myself and paid attention and understood the core concepts and ideas, it clicked, and then I really enjoyed it and got into it. The story and setting is wickedly cool, playing as a lightning sorcerer and doing wombo damage with trailing combos on demons is so satisfying. And seeing the spectacle of destruction and chaos, especially when playing with friends, is pure delight. Diablo 4 is probably not the game a lot of fans of the genre hope for, but it is the game that was right for me. I don't know how I booked the trend when it comes to Blizzard. From my perspective as someone who's not that big into these kinds of games, Diablo 4 is fantastic. When I make these lists of games, it's always hard to choose which ones go into certain spots. What traits do I value? How do you judge quality between all the games and decide which one you enjoy more? There are a lot of different criteria and people make their judgment and form their opinions in all sorts of manner. A pretty common way to rank games is by how fun they are. A complicated way is by how much impact they have. Immortality is probably not better than a lot of these games I've already talked about as far as enjoyment or having pure fun. It's also probably not impactful on the video game industry like some of the games I've already mentioned and will mention. But it will linger in my mind longer than many of these other games. That specific impact is what I'm talking about. It's a mystery box where you watch so many video clips forwards and backwards to piece together whatever you think happened. Yes, there is an official plot, but this game does so little, yet so much to create this package with art, sex, power, storytelling, and many other themes layered within one another, both implicitly and explicitly. I love when a title attempts to challenge the concept of video games. It's one of the most unique games I've played in recent memory. It's also not a video game in the traditional sense where you try to complete objectives. I only realize I found an important clip because an achievement will pop up, and I will have to rewind and playback scenes to better understand what the hell happened. And to play the game, you're watching three full movies all out of order, so the engagement is way different than playing a straight shooter. It's not for everyone, but I do recommend if you are up to the task to try this out. 
Hell yeah, Signalis rules. Take the premise of making a modern version of the original Resident Evil games with a top-down view, extremely limited inventory system, and in-depth puzzles, and you get one of the best survival horror games out there. Signalis presents an extremely loose story that takes place on a spaceship involving AI machines. The zombies or monsters are pretty standard. You can run past them or try to take them out if you're backtracking a lot. The puzzles are really neat and it feels rewarding when you piece together which quest items to use or picking up the hints throughout a level, especially the difficult ones. Probably its best traits are how much risk it takes with its gameplay mechanics and the dev's deliberate choice to mess with the player at times. It's funny because I chastise Pokemon for relying on what I think are outdated mechanics, and yet Signalis wears that badge of honor on his chest. The difference is how these games were built around those mechanics. It may be outdated in this current age, but Signalis was creative with those restrictions. And the dread of playing through a game is here, and that's the best feeling when playing in any survival horror game. Whoa, another good Mario game from Nintendo? Who would have thought? Super Mario Bros. Wonder is pure video game joy. In a much needed refresh of 2D Mario Direction, Nintendo went zany with the Wonder Seeds, creating these special challenges within levels. All the details here are perfect and fit together so nicely. The sound and music are crisp, the animations are lively and full of character, the levels are <coughs> Wonderful! This game is charming with a sense of escapism and fun. Casual players looking for a clean good time and hardcore fans looking for challenges won't be disappointed. It's impossible to not smile while playing this game. No one will have a bad time playing this game unless you do 4 player co-op. 2023 was the year of Spider-Man 2. Get it? Across the Spider-Verse was an amazing film, and Marvel's Spider-Man 2 was a spectacular game. The best part of Spider-Man 2 is there's two of them. The worst part is it still has these side character missions, but they're much less tedious than before, I guess. Spider-Man 2 increases the scope and depth of the previous entries. Insomniac upgraded arguably the best traversal system in video games. The seamless transition between web slinging and gliding is an absolute blast. The combat gameplay is more or less the same as before, but still reliable. And spontaneous moments with special guest stars are such a sweet treat. Insomniac balanced the Spider-Man really well. Well, both Peter Parker and Miles Morales have their own story beats, personal stakes, and side missions that fit together nicely. The distinction between the two characters are exemplified with that balance. Also, shout out to Miles Morales as this character is having a renaissance, and I'd imagine we are not far off from a live action version of him soon. Spider-Man 2 makes it really hard to play the previous games, which is how much of everything is better in this one. A crowd pleaser and definitely up there with Batman Arkham City as one of the best superhero games of all time. Come on, I can't go a year without playing at least one FromSoft game. Armor Core 6 Fires of Rubicon may not be a Souls-like, but it's still freaking good. Probably the most accessible mech controls I've ever played. The balance of simplicity and complexity is such a fine line, and Armor Core walks that line like a circus professional. You can customize your mechs to your playstyle. You can build Speedy Gonzales or Slow's Molasses Tanks. You can paint almost any part of your mech to any color you desire. And then you go through the missions, shooting and dodging thousands of bullets, lasers, missiles, bombs, and energy swords. You have to fight to your strengths and agilities, but you must be conscious of your limitations otherwise it's mission fail. The scale of the world and the battlefield is immense, but suffocating with its dreariness. But wow, it's so much fun when you come out on top in these 1v1s or obliterate these mechanical kaijus. I know FromSoft has found their bread and butter with the Souls-like blueprint, but I hope they continue with the Armor Core series because I want more. Capcom had the arduous task of remaking the genre defining title and they delivered. Resident Evil 4 Remake will probably not have the same defining legacy as the original, but it's essentially the best version of that classic. The amount of care and intention the devs had on this game shows and it's a pure delight. Every pixel, sound, and mechanic were carefully orchestrated and tuned to recapture the essence of the game that has been a flashpoint for third person shooters. The story, gameplay, and horror surpassed the original in almost every way and is a must play for newcomers, fans of the original, and the diehards. I really love this game. The characters, art direction, writing, combat, pacing, and quirks all blend together so well. Not to mention how much you can feel the genuine love the devs have for JRPGs that inspired Sea of Stars. It probably has the smoothest RPG mechanics going from the turn-based encounters then back to trekking through the overworld with no interruptions. The world is fully realized and surprising. 
and Garo is arguably the character of the year. Like, he's not the main character, but he's so charismatic that he charms gods. Sea of Stars is a fantastic labor of love and worthy of all the accolades. No lie, I was expecting Liza P, a Souls-like take on the story of Pinocchio to be mid. And it's anything but. This is a Souls-like that stacks up against From Software's own catalog. Not many other games can do that. Liza P steals so much of the Souls formula from the bonfires, SS Flask, leveling system to the combat mechanics, the narrative structure, and even the button inputs. And honestly, many other Souls-like can learn from this. But the real magic trick was how Neo Wiz in Round 8 was able to innovate some mechanics, creating something distinct from From Software's games. Not to mention the story and setting is surprisingly well thought out and clever. I really enjoy this dark and gloomy take on the story of Pinocchio. There are a few minor issues, like some of the stargazers are far from the boss rooms, and the difficulty can be a little rough in some spots. I think a big challenge for some players may be thinking this game is exactly like Bloodborne or Sekiro, but it's not. Once you come around to the idea that Liza P is its own game with its own mechanics and traits and grasp that concept, the floodgates of enjoyment open up if you love Souls Likes. And in a year with a lot of sequels and remakes, Liza P stands out. Remember when I talk about impact? This is another one of those games. Void Stranger is one of those multi-puzzle Rubik's Cubes where trying to solve one of them changes the other puzzles. It's deceptively simple at first, cosplaying as a Sokoban style game where you just need to get your player character to the stairs to progress. But almost at the jump, you know something's wrong with the game. Then when you do something accidentally or realize a certain cutscene was off, you form an idea of what's happening, but you're not sure. Then you're digging a hole and then a dozen other holes because somehow, some way, there's something else. Something has to make sense. And eventually it does. Then it doesn't. Then you see something else entirely that changes the whole concept. In fact, I'm never sure what is going on with this game. It's traveling through the infinite levels of this hell of the abyss. This is my journal for this game just to help me contextualize the WTF of Void Stranger. I'm purposely vague on this game because that's the entire joy of it. That you know nothing and everything. And I mean everything on the screen is part of the unknown. And that the unknown is staring back at you. And the soundtrack is ingrained in my head long after I got the true ending. Void Stranger is the best indie game of the year. It has the shattered storytelling of Signalis, the puzzle secrets discovery of Tunic, the charm and subtlety of Undertale, and the insane bottomless pit of intrigue, creepiness, and terror of an urban legend that's been folding around for decades. The biggest drawback is how this isn't a game made for everyone. It's really weird and while its gameplay is pretty straightforward, it has some hard puzzles and <coughs> riddles. But if this game sounds a bit interesting to you, I highly recommend to try it out. One of the most subversive games I've ever played an experience many others do not come close to replicating. In a way, Void Stranger would be my game of the year, but it unfortunately came out in 2023. What do you expect from a Zelda fan? I've been waiting for a new mainline Zelda title for six years. My life has changed so much during those six years, and I've personally experienced heartbreaks and euphorias during all that time anyone else has. Six years is a long time. And then it's not. I was 25 when Breath of the Wild came out and then I was 31 for tears. It feels like a blink of an eye right now as I'm making this video. I was the same person at 25 but different. Their permutations changed drastically and constantly over the years. I know an easy response is that's how life is and yeah duh I didn't think otherwise but I'm human. I do human things and I try to find meaning into concepts and ideas that are not connected or related at all. And by now you're wondering, what does this have to do with Tears of the Kingdom? Nothing. But it's everything to me. Do I really, truly, deep down believe that my life is somehow connected with a popular franchise from a particular video game studio in Japan? Of course not. I'm not that weird or crazy. But I'm a little stitious, and I honestly separate phases of my life based on Zelda releases. And I don't know how to explain my feelings for Tears of the Kingdom, but I know it's there. It's probably heightened just cause Zelda series is one of my favorite franchises and I have so many fond memories of each and every Zelda game I play. Maybe I'm too much of a fanboy and was going to rank this game as my number one no matter what, but I don't care. 
There's a billion videos of people playing this game. They all have valid critiques and praises. I understand all of the positive and negative takes. If you want to see what the game fundamentally is, it's all right there. And one day, I'll make a video going more into Tears of the Kingdom because I have so much more to talk about. But I didn't rank it number one just because it's an amazing game. It's a fully realized game built on top of what I thought was a fully realized game. If you want an analysis of the game itself, I'll offer you this. I teared up twice while playing this game. Once, after the initial shock that I was playing Tears of the Kingdom, and I was skydiving down a Hyrule after the intro level. And the second time, when I'm skydiving to save Zelda after a cinematic and climactic final boss fight. I'm that invested. Almost every new Zelda game that comes out becomes one of my favorite games ever. And Nintendo blew my stupidly high expectations. But Tears of the Kingdom is the end of a phase of my life. And the beginning of a new one. Let me pretend there's this deep connection to this series that I have loved for so long long. So however long it takes for Aonuma and Fujibayashi and the rest of the team to make the next entry, I'll be waiting to play it, waiting to see how my life turns out in 5, 6 or whatever amount of years. Cause for the next one, I get to play with Lil This Way, where we can fight the monsters, solve the puzzles, and help Princess Zelda save Hyrule together.